Venua, the floor is all yours. You're going to talk about tra the travel industry as, as you see it and what is the future of this industry going forward, uh, especially because of the drastic repercussions uh, of the COVID virus. Good. Thank you, Mira, for the introduction. Um, ready to go. So thank you, Patrice. My uh, a very, very, very interesting landscape on the media front. And we're going to go to a completely different industry uh, and, and sector, which is, uh, which is, which is travel. Uh, and um, a big thank you to Mira for, uh, for organizing all this uh, and for allowing us to have this, this platform, right, to continue to, to share uh, with each other. So big, big thank you. Um, I'm going to try to provide you with uh, an overview of how COVID-19 has pretty much upended uh, the, uh, the travel and tourism sector. Um, it is uh, the, the, the shift that we're going through is seismic <laughs> uh, and, and uh, the uh, after effects will be seen for many, many years to come. Uh, and I will, I will try to touch a little bit on what those effects are. I will focus mostly on the hospitality industry and the airline industry. Uh, which is a subset right, of the travel and tourism sector. Uh, but for time reasons, I'm going to deep dive on, on those two uh, as, as a primary piece. And I'm also going to share with you a little bit of how a company like the one I work for, Expedia Group, uh, has been hit by this crisis and how we have coped with it and are coping with it uh, on, on a daily basis. So a little bit of insights as to how, how we tackled it. Please take the projections with a grain of salt. I will share a couple of projections. I'll share the methodology as well, leveraging the, uh, the McKinsey framework. Um, so please, the, please, please do take those uh, with a grain of salt because the evolution is, is changing almost on a daily basis. And so they're only as good as the data that led to them. Uh, and that is changing uh, a lot. And then of course, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time should you have um, any, any questions. Um, okay, so if we, if we take a look at this, let's go back to the beginning of this, uh, what is, will definitely be coined the Annus Oribidis of travel and tourism. Uh, in January, beginning of this year, everything looked uh, fairly good. Uh, you know, trade conferences were taking place all over the world. Uh, business travel had never seen as much spend and or uh, occupancy. Families were still taking leisure trips uh, to Disney and or to their favorite beach. Uh, and the hospitality industry was seeing record ADRs uh, and, and occupancy rates as well as, as revenue per available room, RIFPAR, which is the, uh, the key metric we use uh, in that industry. So everything, everything looked pretty good. Uh, on the Expedia Group front, we were going through a lot of change at our company. Some of you may or may not know this, but we uh, basically changed our CEO, changed our CFO late 2019, right? And so that was just internal change that we were going through, but the macroeconomics of our sector uh, were uh, fairly healthy. And this was reflected uh, in, in our trading, right? So trading looked good, uh, strap plans were being executed, uh, executive and leadership teams were bullish, uh, everything was, uh, was going just fine. Fast forward 30 days to February, and then we started to have the first signs uh, that essentially the COVID-19 virus was making its way outside of China, right, and into um, parts of EMEA uh, and uh, in, in Asia. Uh, very low counts at the time, I don't know if you recall, but very, very low counts. Uh, confidence was very high that the virus would be contained uh, and that the spread would be limited. Uh, and so, of course, we didn't make too much of this. Um, but it started to reflect in uh, our trading numbers, as you can see here, right? So we basically had a halt of the growth uh, that we were seeing in, in January. And what's interesting about this is uh, that, you know, being a global company, right, with 115 country points of sale, right, across the world, uh, we're able to pick up signals very, very, very early, right? Uh, even before a, a, a mega trend uh, is, is declared, we were seeing essentially the nervousness of the customer reflect in uh, the purchasing behaviors uh, and, and the booking patterns uh, on, on a various site. No cause for alarm yet, but we did double down on uh, focusing and watching the trends. And we put together a small monitoring group, right? Just as any reasonable company would to make sure that we're able to mitigate the risk uh, going forward. And then March happened. <laughs> And on March 11th, the World Health Organization essentially declared uh, COVID-19 a, a pandemic. Uh, and from that day on, uh, in a nutshell, um, all hell broke loose, pretty much, right? And you start to see that in our trading as well, right? So that pause 
uh, became essentially a massive, massive deceleration uh, of, of our booking volumes all over the world. Uh, and we went down to, I think in less than a week, we went down to 15% uh, of our 2019 levels uh, in terms of bookings. So if the impact was only a softness in bookings, that's hard. That's very hard on any PNL, as you can imagine, but it's something that you can, you can cope with, right? That you can, you, you can manage. Um, we at the time had no idea really what we were going into. Uh, and, and that's what I'm going to walk you through a little bit over the next uh, two slides. Um, I'd like to say that essentially this was a perfect storm uh, for the industry, a fabulous movie for those who haven't seen it. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and it truly was right on multiple levels, uh, a, a perfect storm. Many of our leadership team members uh, had that ex same expression uh, on their face as we were going through the, uh, the crises. Uh, and we really had to get our kind of our act together just to first try to comprehend uh, what we were facing uh, and what we were getting ourselves into. So let me, let me explain a little bit with, uh, with the next slide. Uh, you essentially had a collection of heterogeneous factors coming together at, at the same time, right? And, and the challenge for a company like ours was how do you make sense of a chaotic, um, unorganized response uh, on a global basis from both public sectors and the private sector, right? That, that was essentially, if you take a look back, what was, what was the challenge? We had government bans that we had no control over, neither on timing uh, nor on scope. We had mandatory quarantines, uh, we had essentially the private actors in the industry, airlines and hotels, reacting to the virus uh, and to the crises in different ways, uh, issuing all of them different policies, right? And so some would offer a refund, some would offer a, a, a voucher, uh, some would do so for the next 30 days, some would do so for travel booked in 30 days for the next month and a half, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the, the point is, um, the number of variables that you're trying to optimize for and manage becomes unmanageable, right? There's actually no way for us to be able to operationalize uh, what, was, what was taking place. And this made it extremely difficult for us to, to operationalize, as I said, our, our customer service levels, right? Uh, on, on a global basis. You have to react to both uh, customer inquiries. So people calling in saying, hey, can I travel? Can I not? Just for information. Others saying, I want to cancel. I want to change my plans. And then you also have to have a proactive approach to your customers. When you heard that a given a hotel chain uh, or airline was changing its policies, and then you had to inform uh, your customers, right? So you're, you're, you're reacting and, and you're being reactive and proactive at, at the same time across multiple fronts and, and multiple uh, dimensions. On a bad quarter, a company like Expedia, we've seen crises before, we've been around for, for over 25 years, so this is not new, but on a bad quarter, you would, you would handle one or two crises affecting one or two countries, right? Um, like, you know, a storm in the Caribbean or the, the volcano in Iceland, uh, things of the sort, right? What you never had to handle is, is this happening across every single point of sale and every single point of supply uh, at, the, uh, at the same time. Uh, and to add a little bit of complexity to the mix, uh, you are also reacting as a company with your staff to, uh, to the crises, right? So you're closing down your offices, you're allowing people to work from home. So you have, you have the apex of, uh, of, of crisis management at a time when your teams are essentially remote uh, and, and, and not coming together, right, in the the habitual format environment or ceremonies uh, that they're accustomed to. So essentially what this leads to is what you see on, on the left here. First, an incredible amount of confusion. Right? People just didn't know if they could travel, not travel, and what were the conditions, et cetera, et cetera. If their booking was honored, not honored, canceled, refunded, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of confusion. Uh, our inability to cope with that, right, as effectively as we would have in normal circumstances led to customer frustration, as you can imagine, uh, which leads to uh, kind of the... Uh, the, the, the brand reputation crises that a lot of players in the sector uh, are now having to, to face and cope with uh, uh, today and, and probably for uh, some time. Okay, uh, what did we do? Well, we essentially, uh, you know, we had to react very, uh, very quickly. So we had to put together a, a, a rapid response uh, playbook uh, and, and framework, uh, which, is, which is what we've done. Um, you first implement and then you inform. <laughs> You act and then you think in, in many times, in many circumstances, uh, when the pressure is, is that high on some of what we've done. Uh, and what you're doing is you're rewriting the rules of, of the marketplace, of the two-sided marketplace that you're, uh, that you're running. Uh, we had to essentially devote and pivoted 
uh, all our resources towards protecting the customer and customer service. Right? So this is the biggest pivot we've ever had at the company. Um, you know, you used to fight for engineers left and right for certain projects in a company like ours. Uh, and now they are all very easily <laughs> directed towards one thing, uh, which is facilitate uh, travel plan changes, right? Uh, and, and, and customer service. Uh, we had to define new flexible policies. Uh, so for example, what happens when somebody calls for a hotel that is closed, but only for 30 days or 45 days? Uh, do you cancel the trip? Do you offer a voucher? Do you extend or allow, uh, you know, sometimes flexible policies to your customer because you want to do right by your customer, but they're not necessarily honored uh, by your, your supplier. Uh, and in those points of tension, who wins? Uh, what happens, right? If, 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 if your supplier does not take on the fees or the cost of relocating a guest, you, you bear that uh, for your customer on behalf of the supplier. Uh, and if so, what, is, what are the financial implications of, of a decision like that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very difficult. Uh, and then we had to assess and address a lot of the end-to-end -end platform self-service uh, capabilities that were never designed to sustain this amount of strain uh, or pressure. And so what you see is you basically see all the vulnerabilities of your platform kind of manifest itself, right? Within, within 28 to 48 hours. And then you're in a mode where you're, uh, you're seeing the vulnerability and then quickly, quickly, right? Addressing those, um, those pain points. Two, protect the king. In this case, uh, the, the king is, 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 is cash. Um, as I said earlier, the way our model works is new bookings pay for right, refundability of past bookings, right? That's how it works, right? And so if, if your new bookings dries up, all your source of cash dries up, right? And then everybody's pulling on the, on the bank, right? Saying, hey, I want my, my refund. Uh, you get into a, a very difficult uh, cash flow management uh, situation, which by the way, every actor uh, industry uh, has been facing. So two is what do we do there? And then so you start, you cut, right? You cut all unnecessary spend and you protect, protect, protect the cash uh, as, as, uh, as much as you can to weather, weather the storm. Um, we've also developed uh, very robust uh, playbooks on, on how, do we, how do we handle uh, this response, both customer communication and uh, reactivity to customer inquiries at, uh, at scale. Um, and the challenge there is uh, how do you run a company when PLs no longer inform your decisions? When there's no longer any momentum that you can base your models on, how do you plan for the week ahead? Right. Uh, and, and, and so you're, you're, you're driving, essentially you're driving blind. It's what it feels like. You're driving blind for the, for the first time uh, in, 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 in a long time. And I guess that's, that's tricky as well. A lot of our uh, uh, processes, a lot of our optimization is done through algorithms, right? Like many companies. And so your algorithms of course are completely in, in a tailspin because uh, these extraordinary events disrupt right, all your models. Uh, and so you got to put everything basically on, on out of automation mode and you're back to manually managing your business the way you did before, right? But again, uh, that shift is not as, as easy, right? As, um, as one can think. And then finally, you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. And so this was, I think, one of the first quotes from our, uh, one of the first directives from our CEO, um, which is, okay, well, if this is going to be hard, how do we make sure that we come out of this crisis, right? Uh, stronger, right? Than we got uh, coming into it. And so you really rethink, not only how do I cope with the immediate response that is needed and required for customers, but what do we need to do differently today because of the crises and what windows of opportunity does the crisis provide us that we want to capitalize on and seize uh, to make ourselves a leaner, better, uh, more profitable or more formidable uh, competitor uh, coming out of the crises. And so uh, that was actually, I'd say the silver lining, which is you, you really rethink everything you're doing. Uh, every important project that was a P1 before basically gets, gets scrutinized uh, and, and you rethink potentially in, in longer outlooks, right? You're not constrained by the performance on a quarter to quarter basis as the street always and often imposes on you. And you're able to take a step back and say, okay, well, what are the investments or pivots we want to make for the next three, five, 10 years, right? Uh, and so I would say that would be one of the silver linings of the crisis is it provides you with a, a longer term outlook uh, that too often you can't afford uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. There, one other learning for me, uh, and I'm sharing it with everyone, uh, affected or not affected by COVID, but is pay pay your debts. <laughs> and what I mean by this is uh, being uh, somebody from the, the product and tech uh, background, um, there's something called technical debt, right? That always needs to be paid back. And every engineer in the world knows this uh, very well. Uh, but there's such a thing as a marketing debt. There's such a thing as customer service support debt. There's such a thing as a financial operations debt, right? And, and when days are good, you go after the next, and the next dollar, and then you kind of put, put aside some of those inefficiencies, right? Uh, or, or creaky uh, platform capabilities. And then when it, it comes under a very uh, stressful point, such as the one that COVID has, 
um, impose on us, you really ask how important it is to make sure that you always, always are investing in the health uh, of your platform, whether that's product or tech or uh, other services uh, or parts of query. And that really is, is what will make some companies bounce back from COVID stronger than ever. This is probably what explains why some companies won't make it past COVID, right? But this is something you got to be very careful of because it could provide uh, a leap moment uh, for your competition. So what did we do with this? Uh, well, one of the first questions and probably still the question today is, when do you turn your investment and your marketing or customer acquisition activities back on, right? Uh, and so that is, that is extremely hard, right? You can look at your own pacing, but your own pacing uh, provides a lot of false negatives, right? Uh, and can provide too much ambiguity. And so what we're trying to look at is what are the external factors that we can bake into our planning models, right? That can help us assess whether or not we light up a market again, right? Whether we feel comfortable marketing to a customer again, right? Uh, and what is the state of the different uh, stakeholders or constituents in that given market? If I want to push, uh, for example, uh, South uh, Florida, as an example, right? What's the supply situation in Florida? Are hotels open up again in Florida, right? What is the experience my customer will have traveling to Florida, even if I detect that there's an appetite to go to Florida? It doesn't mean that Florida's ready, right, uh, for the pickup. And so you got to look at always the supply side and the demand side uh, dimensions and model this to the best, uh, the best of our abilities. Uh, so we created these, these, these uh, frameworks. I'm just giving you a, a, a screenshot. And we have two, uh, two new indexes that we use, the stringency index and the mobility score index. Um, and so the stringency index, and I will uh, share a little bit more about that, is basically we're tracking eight government responses on every single country in the world. Right? We look at school closures. We look at workplace closures. We look at public events being canceled, public transportation closures, state home policies, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives us a flavor for how ready that destination is to welcome uh, tourism again and to make sure that what people are paying for when they want to travel is going to be meeting uh, their expectations. And then we have the mobility index and the mobility index leverages Google and Apple mobility trends, right? So this is essentially how often are people moving through the activity that uh, travelers have using uh, the maps, products, uh, and, and, and applications, which is very powerful. So if people are not moving, then you, you know that they're probably still in lockdown mode, right? But when you start to see requests for directions go back up again, that means that there's fluidity, right, of mobility uh, in that market. And that is a, usually a good sign, one vector uh, that signals that a market is, is reopening again for potential travel. And so we take these two indexes, right? We mash everything together. We look at our own internal data as well and, and booking trends and patterns. And we come up with a, a phase or a gate of, uh, uh, of recovery for every single uh, tourism destination in the world. And it tells us, okay, well, which ones are ready to bounce back? Which ones are in the crisis, not bouncing back yet? And worse, which ones are going negative, right? Which ones are actually moving back into a negative uh, travel recovery state? And it's a complete mix, right, across the planet uh, of countries and, and, and destinations in different, uh, different states. But no, I, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so um, do you have any estimate on, you know, because obviously, you know, governments reopening and allowing people to travel is, you know, is the first step. But then there's the, you know, the psychological aspect of it. So do you have any um, estimate on the timeline, you know, between the time, let's say, you know, governments will allow certain things to happen and, and the time that people will actually, you know, start traveling or moving again is there is is there a is there already a time frame for that so it's yeah there, there is right there is uh and there's a i can i can guarantee you that across the world there is a lag between uh the willingness of a given uh country and or tourism industry body right to reopen uh and the acceptance of that state uh by by potential uh customers now you got to look at it through two dimensions patrice you got the domestic traveler and then you got the international traveler right so domestic is rebounding much much faster so people are starting to travel the french are starting to travel in france right earlier this summer we saw this as as restrictions lifted but very few of them got on a plane uh, and and left france and this is exactly the same in uh, in the us and i will share a few stats on that as, as we talk about recovery patterns um i would say that international travel or outbound travel uh is pretty much shot for another 18 to 24 months. And let me share a few statistics. I think I have them in, in a few slides that will address specifically your, uh, your question. So what does this mean for the travel tourism industry? I, I talked a little bit about how we Expedia cope, but we are a 
well, we're, we're pretty, fairly big operator in, in the space, but we are compared to the global travel and tourism sector, right, only a, a player. Uh, what you can see here is the projections on uh, the impact of COVID to the travel sector. The travel industry doesn't react well to two types of crises. And this is super important to understand how this is playing out. The first one is the one that affects traveler or customer purchasing power. This is the type of crisis that affected, uh, that was uh, that, 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 um, the, the state of the uh, 2008 financial crisis, right? I, I have less uh, spending power, therefore I'm going to cut back on, on travel because I don't deem it as a P1 expense, right, for, uh, for my household. That's number one. The second type of crisis is the one where customers lose confidence in travel, which is a little bit what Patrice was hinted on, right? And that's what we saw in 9-11, the months following 9-11, and that's again what we saw uh, with SARS, okay? What's happening right now, and this is critical to important, is that COVID is playing on those two vectors at the same time. People are scared, and many have lost their jobs and don't have um, discretionary spending power anymore. And so you're combining the two, and that is creating an incredibly powerful squeeze right, on the actors and operators of, uh, of the sector. Some players, like you know, the online travel agencies, of which Expedia Group is one of, right? most of our spend, most of our cost is sales and marketing. Right? And so we can just cut down on sales and marketing, and, which is what we did in a matter of weeks. We just basically took all the marketing spend out of the company. Right? And so we're able to kind of very quickly adapt and adjust right, uh, our spend levels to a decrease in, in, in revenue. But other actors, uh, if I take Delta, for example, right, sales and marketing is 5% of their operating expenses. Everything is in fixed costs. OTAs don't have fixed costs. Airlines have huge fixed costs, right? So the ability for different sectors to react quickly right, to the crises, again, is, is very different. Nonetheless, what we're seeing here based on current uh, expectations is that tourist arrivals will drop between 60 and 80% uh, by the end of, of 2020 uh, on, on a global basis. So that is a significant uh, dry up of uh, tourism demand. And this will affect different cities uh, and countries uh, differently, right? And so what I'm what I flashing up here is, is uh, essentially the total international visitors in 2019 and the rank by uh, tourism city destination. And on the right is the same chart, but by total visitor spend. So this is 2018 data. I couldn't find 2019 data for you guys, but I can, I can hunt it down if needed. I, and you see this in billions. So my point is, if you're Dubai right now, you're in a world of pain, right? And I'm not talking about the fact that your airlines are probably have their planes parked or that your hotels are operating at a very low occupancy. I mean that the, the revenue on which you run your city, right? Uh, or your country now is, uh, is, is jeopardized, right? Um, and so that's going to prevent them from having COVID response uh, budgets or aids as much as or better uh, than, than other countries. And it's also going to prevent a potential a social spend, right, to help the local population cope with uh, the crises. And this is going to vary uh, by countries uh, across, across the world. But um, as you can see here, the, I would say that the, the cities listed on this, um, on this page, whether it's the right column or the left column, are probably going to suffer more, right, uh, than their peers uh, from uh, the, uh, the COVID crises and the effect on uh, tourism. All right. I know this is all sobering, by the way. It's not as cheerful as Patrice's presentation on, <laughs> on content, but it is, it, is, it is what it is, right? Um, let me share with you now um, a little bit of input on some of the projections I'm going to be sharing. Uh, we are also, by and large, in agreement with, uh, with the, the McKinsey uh, recovery scenarios. Uh, we are indexing on A1, right? And A1, I will just read it out, right? Uh, is basically the virus, um, the virus will be coming back in subsequent but diminishing phases uh, and returning to long-term growth will be slow uh, with a, a muted world recovery. So the point is you will have uh, the virus coming back every time, but probably not as strong, right, every subsequent time as the previous time. But there will not be a kind of V recovery uh, for the travel and tourism sector. I don't think anybody uh, believes this at this, at, at this point, right? Uh, by and large, between 2020 and 2030, uh, the effect of COVID on the global tourism uh, industry will be about $6.4 trillion, right? So that is a significant amount of uh, revenue and wealth 
uh, erosion as a result of the uh, the virus. That, that's that's a lot of money, people. Um, um, uh, Benoit, let me. Uh, can I just interrupt for a moment? Yes. When of all of this is done, and you will hear t what Tony has to say, uh, Tony, the head of R and D from Thermo Fisher, Stefan, and I already recorded that session. We'll have to marry all of this with Tony's predictions, <laughs> and then you will really understand. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Yeah, because it's it's it, it's a systemic crisis. I know, I know. It, it's hard. We, we kind of look at it by silos, by sector, but actually, it, it it's a systemic problem. In in what one sector, one industry has a cascading effect on the next one, right? And if planes are not flying, we're not consuming oil and gas. If oil and gas is not being consumed, then it has an effect on uh, that industry, right? And it just it just trickles down like this, right? In a, in a spiral, um, yeah, it, and it and is. and the order of operations to stem the crises. I guess that's probably the hardest point. Is in what order do you, do you act, right, as a government, right? And in which industry do you bail out first or second? Because the, your, the order in which you actually allocate that spend, which is ultimately uh, the, the, the only stemming mechanism we have today, that and, and of course, acceleration of the scientific community on, on finding a cure, but that order is actually very, very important to get right. Uh, and that's something that I think most, most people don't, don't quite comprehend. I, I think there are a task. couple of baselines, Benoit. One is, do we really expect to be back? In our heads, are we still expecting to be back to where we were when this thing started? And uh, the more people I speak to, the more the answer is no, we're not going back. Where well, the, world, the world as we knew is not coming back. That's the I will, I will share. I will close with uh, the projections of uh, 65 executives from the travel and tourism industry sure, let's, let's do on, this. on what they think. And then you could agree or disagree with that. And of course, nobody has a crystal ball. Um, let me deep dive now on. So you saw it at, at our level. You saw it at a global basis. I'm going to deep dive now on two sectors, the hospitality industry and then the, um, uh, the airline industry. So uh, let's continue down, down our journey. If I look at the hospitality industry, um, some pretty interesting stats, but I'll focus it on, on four of them, right? One is uh, essentially only about a third of Americans, right? So this is the North American hospitality industry data that you're looking at right now. Uh, only a third of Americans have traveled overnight uh, since March, right? So that's, that's a significant uh, uh, reduction. And about 38% of them say they will likely travel again uh, by the end of uh, 2020 versus a 80, 82% right, ratio uh, when, when times are, uh, are good. Two thirds, so 65% of hotels right now remain at or below a 50% occupancy rate. By and large, a hotel operating below 65% occupancy rate does not make money, cannot pay back, right, its debts or its loans, right? So that's means that two thirds of the hotels right now are operating below the occupancy rate needed to be able to uh, sustain uh, their financial obligations. Four out of 10 hotel employees are still not working. Um, and we believe that we will end at about a 40%, um, essentially, uh, 40% uh, unemployment rate, right, in, in this sector, right, at, at the end of the year, uh, compared to a national average of about 10. So that's four times um, uh, more acute uh, in this sector. Um, at the peak of the pandemic, uh, nine in 10 hotels had to lay off of furlough workers. Um, and today, the hospitality industry lost about 7.5 million jobs. Right. So just to give a, a sense of, of magnitude, and this is real world, but this is people who probably struggle not to pay their, their subscription uh, service uh, at, at, at home. Um, so roughly that's what it looks like. I think that we are expecting a 95 billion uh, revenue loss uh, in the U.S. hotel industry by at the end of fiscal year 2020, right? So uh, material numbers uh, for sure. What you see here is the U.S. hotel ref par view. Ref par is revenue per available room, so it's a combination of average daily rates, which is the room at which the the the, the rate at which the room is sold, right, and, and the occupancy rate, which is the fill rate of the hotel. And you combine the two, and you get essentially ref par, right? Um, I'm simplifying here a bit, but you get the you get the idea. What you can see here is that the 9/11 crisis was about four billions in revenue loss for the hospitality industry in the, in, in North America. Uh, sorry, in the U.S a $15 billion loss as a result of the 20, 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and, and we're expecting 95 billion, right, um, for, uh, for COVID. So I know the way to look at it is um, essentially if you take 9-11 and you take the 2008 financial crisis and you multiply that by four, you pretty much get the impact of, of COVID, right? So it is, uh, it is a pretty big shock 
to, uh, to the system. And, and why is this, right? Benoit, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Just going back to the, to the slide you just showed before, um, do you, have, you actually have any estimates on how many hotels or may actually not make it, like basically the loss of rooms and um, capacity? Or, or is it still... Um... It's, it's early. Uh, many of them have opened or reopened in, in some way, shape or form, but with a limited capacity, the larger hotels are able to kind of literally um, isolate floors in the building. So they're not opening up entire floors, right? They keep the, the maintenance cost as low as possible and only opening up a few of them as, as an example. Uh, I'll share a little bit uh, about this in, in a later slide, but we're seeing that it's affecting the hospitality industry uh, sector differently depending on who the actors are. So uh, larger hotels will fare better, right? Because they, have, uh, they can rely on franchisee revenue. Um, we're seeing that the luxury players will suffer more so than what we call the discount uh, or um, 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 uh, hotels. Uh, because most of them were relying a lot on a business travel revenue, which you will see will not come back as fast as leisure, uh, leisure travel demand. Um, and the smaller independent hotels are probably going to fare the best and recover the fastest, right, amongst all of them, uh, simply because a lot of the uh, customers that they cater to uh, are still in activity today, right? So if you take the, uh, the cheap hotels, right, or the motels right, in, in the U.S., that uh, people that are, for example, truck drivers or uh, low-income uh, business travelers uh, rely, relying a lot on rubber tire travel still used. Uh, they can rely on that, that constant demand, uh, whereas the, the, the big luxury establishments are definitely taking a harder hit than, than others. But the answer is how many hotels will permanently close, Patrice? I can actually get that information. I, I think at the latest count, there was about 6,000 that had closed permanently uh, in the U.S. And that was in, my data goes back to August. What that will be at the end of the year, uh, well, I, I, that I don't know, but... Uh, Definitely some have closed forever, of course. Um, and the reason why this is tr tricky is because today, both domestic and inbound leisure travel is, is affected. Uh, and, and the totality, the totality of business travel uh, has, has dried up. And, and I'll share a little bit more on the impacts of, of, uh, of this for, uh, for business travelers. But th that's why this is a, a compounded effect on, uh, on this industry. Um, a uh, couple of things I wanted to share uh, on this front. We're seeing here uh, that at the lowest point, so April was the peak, right? April was the worst point of the pandemic uh, for the U.S. hospitality industry, and it's getting a little bit better uh, ever since. Uh, the low point on revenue per available room uh, went down to $18 from a, a pre-COVID level of 106. So this gives you a sense, right, of magnitude. Uh, it went back down, in, it went back up, sorry, in July to $48. Uh, and it is stabilizing around that level right now, around 50, right, uh, in, in, in August as well, right? So we're still very far. We're still, uh, you know, at, at 50 to 55%, depending on the projections uh, of where the, the healthy level was uh, pre, pre-COVID. And this is, you can see that the patterns look very much the same across all the super regions, right? So it's not just a U.S. story. I use the U.S. a lot because the data is easier to get by, but you can see that the patterns are very consistent across, um, across the world. Um, I just pulled this three days ago. Um, unfortunately, I was hoping to see a, an improvement between July and August, and, and we're not seeing it, right? So what's happening right now is that second phase of lockdowns is actually starting to translate itself in the numbers. And you can see that, you know, we're hitting a plateau where uh, total ref par, right, uh, for the U.S. Has, is plateauing at about a 70%, 74% um, uh, rate. So right now, improvement has stalled, right? And so I think the next, the next phase will be uh, either the, 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 the disease or the, you know, the, the virus uh, retrieves, right? Or there's the introduction of a vaccine, which will uplift and increase uh, confidence in, in consumer patterns. But until one of those two factors happens, we're probably going to plateau at, at, at this level. Hopefully, we're not going to see it go back down again. I think that's what everybody is uh, crossing their fingers for uh, at this point. If I shift gears to another important metric for the hospitality industry is what we call hotel occupancy, right? So the peak, uh, the low point, the low point was in April, uh, where we had occupancy rates uh, fall at 24%. Um, and that's a significant uh, uh, reduction, as you can imagine. And we're back up to the 48, 49%, so roughly 50% of hotel occupancy levels. And we're starting to see that, that first plateau. Um, so that is, that is what we're seeing right now. Um, 
a couple of data points if you're interested. Ben, right? ben Martin. Um, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. When you, when you calculate these, are you taking out the stock that's closed? So this is just rooms that are open for occupancy, is it? No, we're not taking out the stock. Well, we're, we're taking out the stock of hotels that are closed permanently, but if a hotel has closed portions of the hotel, we're still toting the hotel, the total hotel room count. Okay, thanks. So in I'm New York, I'm surprised example, it was as high as 25% in April, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah, no, well, uh, again, right, there, there's industries that rely on, on entire sectors that rely on, 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 on hotel, right? For, for example, uh, uh, for example, in California, what happened with uh, the hotels was the governor gave gave grants to them so that all the homeless people could mm -hmm. go and live in those hotels. So maybe that's one point of reference there, um, in terms of how hotels made money. I, I heard as well that some hospitals have used hotel rooms as well, right, to, to sleep some uh, some patients that didn't need urgent care, as an example. So we just use the beds. Right? Uh, yeah, and the, and the, the hotel is just being very creative and thinking about and how they can uh, how they can repurpose themselves, right? And yeah, try and to extract a little bit of revenue as, from this, right? As with the restaurants, because throughout the pandemic, uh, the contract of feeding uh, senior um, uh, senior citizens and in nursing homes was given to restaurants, so they made money off the government grants, um, so that they could supply food to specific food to um, senior citizens. Patrice, you had a question. Uh, I got a, a couple of data points here I can share with you. Uh, according to OTA Insight, 62% um, of hotels in New York City, for example, were operating before the pandemic, are currently operating. So we're back to 62% of the total hotels in New York. 13% are permanently closed, right? Uh, and the rest is accepting bookings for uh, later in the year. In London, 80% of hotels have reopened uh, versus uh, 33, right, in May. So nice bounce back, 33. To, but now again, they're opening again, but they might be opening at an occupancy rate of 40. And so the, tr the trick is when do you open your hotel? Because if you open it and you start incurring costs of, of running and operating the hotel, but you can't fill it, uh, mm -hmm. then you're in, 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 in the deep red, right? Financially on, on, on your PL. And Asia is, slow, is showing a slightly better picture. 86% of hotels in Shanghai have reopened, right? And 92% uh, of them uh, are operating in Hong Kong, right? So, and you'll see this a little bit later on. Asia is definitely rebounding faster. Uh, than North America from, uh, from this crisis due to uh, strong uh, domestic travel and a higher level of confidence uh, from the population. A few data points here. Uh, I, I look at the bottom left. Uh, so percentage of Americans traveling for the upcoming holidays. This was as of August. Uh, and so uh, you can see that, you know, only 25% of Americans are planning to move uh, and to travel for Thanksgiving, 30% for Christmas. Usually these are both above 50 to 60%, right? In healthy times. Uh, so clearly this is having an effect on uh, future uh, consumer uh, confidence and, 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 uh, and practices. Uh, and as I was saying a, a little bit early on, I won't drain the slide, we covered it, but uh, the luxury sector is going to be hardest hit uh, and uh, independents are gonna open up faster. Uh, certain segments of hotels are going to uh, fare better. Leisure resorts, for example, are showing a strong uptick in demand. Uh, in China, for example, Club Med has seen an increase in occupancy rates, uh, culminating at about 88% right, of occupancy rates for the first half of August. So it, it's not affecting uh, every country the same way, and, and some sub-segments of the hospitality industry are, are faring better. Um, but by and large, uh, we think that lower end hotels and independents will rebound faster than luxury chains. And China specifically uh, is doing better uh, than, than the U.S. at this point. Their occupancy rates now are back down to 10 percentage points below what they were uh, before uh, the pandemic. Uh, same thing for uh, ADRs. Combine the two and then you get a, a, a ref par right, of 23% of delta, but they're definitely recovering um, a lot, lot faster than, than other markets. There is a bright spot, and the bright spot is vacation rentals. So interestingly enough, uh, that sector is booming. <laughs> uh, a lot of operators in this sector are actually seeing year-over-year -year growth uh, between 2020 and 2019 in the year of pandemic, which is contrarian, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's easily explainable, right? I, th I think a lot of people just wanted to get out uh, of, of the house 
uh, and do so in an area that is safe and a house that is uh, secluded uh, with no staff and uh, very uh, allowing for social dis distancing without any form of constraint is very appealing uh, for people. And, and we saw a lot of rentals go up in, in the summer. Um, the joke is that, you know, if you, if you own a secondary home near a lake or river and you weren't charging two to three X your, your weekly rates before, uh, then you were leaving money on the table, right? Or you weren't working hard enough. So uh, a few people made some considerable amounts of dollars uh, during, during the pandemic. Uh, you see this uh, is true for the U.S., but it's also true for Europe. Um, rentals are really taking off. Uh, and again, it, it's not very uh, surprising that is in concentrated European cities. If you were cooped up with two kids for 10 weeks in your 50 square meter apartment in Paris, uh, you only had one, one dream was to rent a house by the seaside or by some lake uh, and just get some, uh, get some space, right? And so uh, that was definitely a pattern that we're seeing. Uh, this uptick has gone down now after the summer. So we, has, we saw a summer peak. Uh, this is coming down, but we expect the vacation rental market to outperform the conventional lodging market um, throughout the next uh, foreseeable future as well. And then finally, um, a couple of, uh, of, of, of points on to close on the vacation rental market. Uh, it's a tale of two halves, really. Um, so when I said that the rental market is doing better, uh, secluded remote rental, vacation rental destinations have done very well. People who had apartments to rent in Paris or in New York did not, right? Uh, and so it is not the entire vacation rental market, but what we call the, uh, the secluded destination rental market. Uh, which is doing uh, well. Um, and you can see that, you know, they, the, the drop in ref par was down by 5% compared to uh, the hospitality or hotel industry down by 65, right? So a, a significant uh, difference between, between the two sectors. Uh, one sector, subsector of the vacation rental market that is really suffering is what we call the master lease model. Uh, so this is where short-term rental management companies, for example, um, sign multi-year multi -year contracts with, with some uh, building owners. Uh, and guaranteeing payments ahead of time. Uh, you can imagine when demand dries up, you can't honor your commitments. And a lot of these companies are essentially uh, either in dire situations or, or, uh, or folding. Uh, Stay Alfred was a, a, a big player. Uh, that one closed. Uh, and then Saunders and Lyric, two other big players in the sector, uh, had to essentially downsize their payroll uh, and reduce their expansion plans. Right? So it's affecting everyone. Also, the, um, the work... Um, um... Uh, work home rental markets where these companies had come into fray. Uh, they were they were literally uh, renting a lot of homes and apartments for for the business traveler, and now their inventory is not full, and yet they have to pay the landlords. Yeah, correct. Like what's it called? Blue something. I, I forgot the name of the company. That's folding. Then there is um, there. There's so many of them. There are at least fifteen startups that raised money, including took investments from bigger players like Airbnb to run uh, the rentals for office uh, going people. And and see that again back to the trickle effects of the virus, right? A lot of people that were making the livelihood on Airbnb, um, right? If they were in city centers. Uh, no longer can, right? And so that, that too is contributing to uh, some form of, of uh, unemployment um, increase. I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about the airline sector. Um, we believe that the global airline industry is estimated to, don't quote me on this, but uh, lose $419 billion, uh, in passenger revenue in 2020. Right? So that's the latest figure uh, that the industry is feeling uh, confident about. Uh, for context, that same industry uh, lost about $70 billion right, in, in, in 2009, following the 2008 crisis, right? So 70 billion, 420 billion, uh, you could see the sheer difference uh, in, uh, in scale. Uh, airlines have been losing approximately, right, $60 billion in cash in Q2 um, for full year operating budgets of about 44 billion. So, so you're losing more in one quarter than what you would earn in an entire year, right, when the industry is, uh, uh, is, is healthy. And so now you understand more the distress of uh, senior airline executives saying, please, please send the care package and the bailout because we will not be able to handle this. Uh, three airlines, China Airlines, Korean Air, uh, and Asiana Airlines have reported profits uh, growth in the second quarter. And that is mostly due to the reliance on cargo. So cargo has done exceptionally well, right, during the crises, um, but uh, a people movement uh, has not. Okay, I got a pop quiz to make this uh, interactive. 
Not interesting. Uh, just for fun, right? When was the last time that the U.S. averaged less than 100,000 daily flights? Does anybody know? 9-11. 9-11. Anyone else want to venture a guess? Um, 85. Okay. 85, 9-11. So we have 2001. We have uh, 1985. Anybody else? Richard, give me a number. 1970. 1921. 1921. <laughs> All right. So we have our chips across the board. Uh, none of you lost. None of you made it this time. But uh, 1954 was the last time that the U.S. ran at less than 100,000 daily flights. So again, just numbers to kind of try to put some some scale, right, uh, and and some measurement on uh, on, on this crisis. Uh, Scheduled flights are down across the world as of October 5th. So this is the latest data that I could pull from you guys for week of October 5th are down by about 50% from a peak of 66 in April, right? So it's getting better, but still 50% uh, 50, 50 of flights are, are canceled. Um, Delta adjusted Q2 revenue declined by 91%. Southwest saw the Q2 revenues falling by 83%. Uh, United Airlines uh, was losing about $40 million in cash per day, right? Uh, in, in Q2. So uh, hemorrhaging is, uh, is a is small word. Um, in Europe, it, the airlines didn't fare much better. Um, we saw that Fran Air France KLM group, right, uh, dropped by 82%. So very uh, much aligned with US carriers. Uh, and International Airlines Group, which owns uh, British Airways and Iberia, that was down by 88%, right? So roughly uh, the, same, uh, the same magnitude. Um, the reason this was hard on airlines, by the way, is because everybody, right, was asking for refunds. It's very important that everybody understand why this happened, right? So basically, saying, everybody said, give me my money back. Uh, in Europe, airlines were not even allowed to provide a voucher option to customers, right? Because the law obligates European airlines to refund the customer. Uh, very quickly, the laws were changed, <laughs> and European airlines were, able, were allowed to essentially extend the voucher, right, for a next trip. Uh, that just, that significantly helped. Right, the cash flow pressures on uh, a lot of the uh, of the uh, the operators. Uh, government bailouts have totaled 123 billion dollars so far, and that is without what Nancy Pelosi is trying to push for the U.S. Uh, currently. Um, but that covers about a fifth of 2019 revenue. Again, to put that in in, in perspective, right? Uh, and of that 123 billion, 67 billion comes in the form of loans and other liabilities that these companies will have to pay back uh, at some point, right? So it's not just uh, free money. Interestingly enough, the French government, which always does things slightly differently, um, has offered Airbus uh, uh, some, some aid, uh, $15 billion in, in total aid package, uh, but with the condition that these companies ramp up investments in uh, low emission uh, aircraft, which I think is a smart way to kind of take a crisis and make something good out of it. Uh, and so Air France is committed to having, halving, cutting in half, uh, domestic flight emissions by 2024. Uh, and restricting short haul flights where uh, train routes uh, are, are operating, right? So that is a step in the right direction for our beautiful blue planet. Uh, in the US, of course, uh, the US is the US, so it doesn't work that way. Uh, $25 billion government bailout, but no, uh, no strings attached on, on climate. Uh, as one expert in the industry said, and I'll quote, sustainability in the US is marginally more important than keeping enough toner in the fax machine, end quote. All right, so that's how serious uh, we take climate change in America. I thought you were going to say keeping enough toner in the president's makeup kit. <laughs> oh, that, right. I will quote you, okay? I will tweak my sentence, uh, Richard, and quote you on the next one. I think it's much better. All right, 92% of uh, carriers are operating. So a lot of them are still operating, which is good, uh, but uh, routes remain closed, right? So 73% of the routes uh, are operating only. Uh, and 52% of seats being sold. So uh, still a lot of pinch uh, on this industry, which means uh, planes will continue to be parked everywhere there is space at the airports across the world. Um, another interesting point of view is recovery patterns. Uh, what you could see here is data from the 5th of October. Uh, you could see that, uh, you know, uh, US airlines uh, at, on, on the left-hand side at the top red box are, uh, uh, are, are suffering as well as European and LATAM ones. Uh, but Air China, right, and other Asian airlines are, are doing much better, right? They're almost back to uh, seating capacity that was pre-2020. 
uh, pre-COVID. So there's a, diff- a, a much faster recovery, again, in, in Asia. And we're seeing this not only in the hospitality sector, but we're also seeing it in the uh, airline sector. Um, but as of October forecast, we, sh- we have seen a slowdown in the pace of recovery, except for Asia Pacific, right? So everywhere, right, that that forecast is rerun. Uh, the latest one, which is the October forecast, shows a slower recovery than what we had anticipated uh, in, in September, unfortunately. So we're not out of the woods just quite yet. Uh, and industry experts expect that the year that we will be above the 2019 line is now 2024. So that is still roughly uh, three and a half years from now. So you can see when I say that this is going to be a slow recovery uh, for the sector, uh, we expect the hospitality industry to bounce back to pre-2019 levels in 2023. And we expect the airline industry to bounce back to 2019 levels in 2024. So we are in it for the long haul, pun intended, for the uh, airline industry. Benoit, this is uh, Stefan. I mean, it's, uh, it's really interesting because that's exactly the same uh, time frame that we're expecting PCR testing to continue basically growing. So uh, we, it looks like uh, we're converging. We have contra- converging. Uh... Good, thanks. Um, and again, right, many things can change. And if people in the, uh, the, the again, if if, vi- if, if if solutions to the virus are, are rolled out faster, then then you know the, these these numbers can change. But based on the information we had, these are the latest uh, projections. Um, to Patrice's point. Um, so what does it look like in terms of recovery? Uh, we think that vacation uh, to see friends and family is going to essentially uh, return to 2019 levels by 2023, which I said, same thing about for leisure travel. Corporate travel, however, will not, right? And so what's important to remember, I'll try to keep it in one sentence, business travelers make up about 12 to 15% of uh, a plane's passengers, right? But they represent... 75% of, of the profits on some routes, right? So it is extremely important for airlines to have business travelers. Uh, and, and that business is not expecting to come back. See, we're still at minus 16 in 2024. Uh, so we could expect at least maybe five, six, seven, eight years uh, before business travel comes back to pre-2019 levels, which is a very, very uh, long horizon. I won't talk about the car, too much about the car industry and the cruise industry, other than to say that essentially they have been hard hit as well. Uh, car rental companies are offloading hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Uh, Hertz filed for chapter 11 in May, uh, Hertz Group, which is the biggest group. Um, and as part of the $650 million deal with creditors, if I'm not wrong, they needed to offload more than 180,000 cars by 2021. So here's the pro tip. If you're in the US and looking to buy a car, now is the time. <laughs> it has never been cheaper to buy that gas guzzling SUV. So uh, go for it and uh, treat yourself to that. Um, but essentially, yes, 40% of its fleet needs to be shed by Christmas this year. So that is a uh, very powerful a cut. Um, ride sharing companies have pivoted, right? Uh, they do not transport people anymore, but they transport food, right? So they have completely pivoted to uh, delivery uh, services. Uh, which is, you know, which is an interesting way to kind of make the most of a bad situation. Uh, but still, right, Uber is expected to report, uh, sorry, Uber reported a $1.8 billion loss during the second quarter uh, and has let go of 14% of its employees, right? Uh, so uh, they are being hard hit as well. Same for Lyft, about the same magnitude. Um, same situation in, uh, in Europe, uh, but Hong Kong and New Zealand are seeing uh, an increase, right, in ride sharing. Uh, services, right? So again, uh, not the same picture uh, of the world. What's interesting is new alliances are being made. So for example, something would have been unheard of before the pandemic. Uh, Lyft and Sixth, so Sixth, the car rental company, have now uh, created uh, a deal uh, where essentially uh, Sixth uh, inventory will be made available on the Lyft app, right? Um, And in return, um, uh, Sixth will benefit from um, essentially demand algorithms, consumer engagement capabilities, uh, and, uh, and the expertise that Lyft has in managing a car and a fleet of cars, right? Which is something that uh, ride-sharing companies are not as experts as, right? And so everybody's basically coming together. And I, you know, I think Avis and Uber have announced 
a, a similar deal, right? So you're seeing those two sectors kind of morph and I wouldn't be surprised that the rental car business essentially and the ride sharing business are essentially the same players, right? In, in two or three years from now, you will not see that uh, delineation as you did uh, in, in the past. And, and maybe the dealerships will come and play later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that industry is going to go undergo some, some pretty good transformation. On um, the cruise space, I think what you're going to see is a compression of that industry. Uh, they have basically halted all development and construction of new ships, right? Uh, and a lot of the cruise operators are selling their ships. I don't know who you sell cruise ships to, quite frankly. That's an I, I have been looking around for this information because, you know, if you have to sell like 15, 15 20 boats of this size, if you're not going to operate them as a cruise line, what do you do with 20 boats like that? I, I, I have no idea, right? So literally, I, I think they repurpose a lot of 747s, for example, right? To not to carry passengers, but to carry cargo. And I wonder if these will not become container Hospitals? ships or, or hospitals. I don't know. It, it's an interesting question that nobody can answer for me. So if, if you know somebody that has the answer, let me know. What you know, do you do have, with cruise ships? <laughs> we have Ben Clément, uh, who's, uh, who's a lo- an alumni, uh, who is actually working at Carnival, if we, oh. if we can reach him. All right. Well, then he should do the deep dive on the cruise industry. That'd be a fantastic follow-up to this presentation because I have no idea what you do with these huge boats. Because all so, we know right now is Trump gives them a lot of money to sustain this cash burn. And no, it, no, 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 no. That, that is actually false. The cruise actually, industry yeah, the return, yeah, the, the has received one. no government bailout. Yeah. None. He Not was a going dime. to give it to his friend and then it was stopped. Yeah. Right. I remember now. You're right. I remember. Yeah. Uh, which of there's course, some, there's some yeah. failed examples of having them docked and turned into sort of permanent hotels, but at a port. But it's definitely not something you can do at scale, and it's never worked very well. But even even so, right? When the when the when the hospitality industry is compressed, right? Yeah, and there's too I, many rooms. You're actually making a, a situation worse. Making right? a problem worse. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right, I will uh, close the presentation on um, maybe just sharing a few outlook scenarios. Um, so this is the recap of an interview with 65 of the leading uh, travel tech and travel tourism uh, operators. Uh, and this is what, you know, what they see uh, in, in the future, uh, at least for the next six to 12 months. Um, so I think one is we're in this for another two years at least, right? There is no V-curve recovery. Uh, this industry is going to be depleted for at least another two years. Not much more than that, but two years with a very high degree of certainty. And that is being baked into all the recovery forecasting, the capital investment, uh, you know, uh, modeling, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that in mind. Two, inclusion and diversity is seeing a step change in the travel industry. Uh, so we are no longer paying lip service inclusion and diversity. And that is a very positive thing for an industry that, you know, in some regards has been a little bit of a laggard uh, on this, uh, on, on this sector. So that is, uh, that is great. Um, there is little to no trust in political leadership. Science must save us all, right? So please, uh, the scientific community out there, uh, help help our beloved uh, travel and tourism industry. Uh, four, um, I think everybody agrees that there was some form of excess, right? Uh, in terms of how much the travel and tourism industry has contributed to both climate, the climate crises, right? as well as over tourism and, and destroyed some, uh, some local economies. I think if you are a Venetian, you probably uh, don't like the tourism industry too much. Um, that said, uh, I think everybody feels that we're gonna turn the page and things will get better and we will be more um, constrained and measured. Uh, I don't believe it one second. I think that the minute that the dollars flow again, everybody's gonna go after the dollars. So I don't believe that for one second, but I'm, I'm sharing that some of these executives uh, feel that. Um, I may be more cynical than my peers uh, in, in the business. Um, business travel is in for a permanent long haul change, right? I expect anywhere between five and 10 years. And I think it is, it is time for uh, players that are relying, overly reliant on the, the business travel segment to, to think differently or pivot. Uh, but that is going to be a very tough segment to be in uh, for the time to come. International long haul will be dead uh, for a long time. I think a lot of companies are just completely slashing their T&E um, um, budgets. Uh, we see that because we have a corporate travel division at Expedia uh, and we're seeing that, right? So companies are now basically signaling that for 2021 uh, forecast, uh, T&E expenses will be cut by anywhere between 30, 50, 60%, right? So that means that even if they could, uh, executives could jump on a, a, you know, a long haul flight, uh, the budgets won't be there for reimbursement. And so you, that is going to also uh, reduce the, spa- the pace of recovery for, uh, for business travel. 
Uh, companies are becoming a lot more agile, right? Six weeks is the new six months. <laughs> I can tell you at Expedia that we have done things in 30 days that have been on our roadmaps for four and a half years. Um, and so, uh, you know, necessity is the mother Hi. of invention. This is proven right yet again. Yes, Mira. Okay. I didn't uh, see anything. I was mute. All right. Good. I'm hearing voices now. <laughs> Uh, the hotel check-in experience will change. I think you're going to see a lot more adoption of technology in the hospitality sector. Contactless technology is going to dominate, as will uh, augmented reality. Uh, those are two sectors that are going to see a big boom, right? So if uh, those are two, th those are two uh, travel tech sectors that I would closely watch. Um, domestic travel will trump international travel. Uh, there will be winners and losers of that, right? China is going to benefit immensely from a focus on domestic travel. I think they stand to gain an additional $240 billion uh, in tourism revenue windfalls. Uh, in Germany, an, an incremental 44. Uh, the US, however, will suffer from that, right? Uh, so unfortunately, uh, not as rosy for the US uh, tourism sector. Uh, don't expect much M&A in the hospitality market due to uncertainty levels, right? There's just too much in the air now. The dust needs to settle. So I think there's gonna be a slowdown in M&A activity uh, in that sector. Um, Everyone that's not in the cruise business is happy not to be in the cruise business. And that's probably going to remain true uh, for the next two years. Uh, and finally, uh, small and local businesses. So we forget it often. We think that tourism is, is hotels, flights, and car rentals and cruise. It's actually a lot more than that, right? It's, it's restaurants. It's small mom and pop operators of activities all over the world. Uh, and they are going to bleed, literally bleed. Uh, I, I, would, I, I would, I think there's a strong parallel between the, the the small mom and pop shop on the high street, right? And the small tourism operator, right? In, in the travel sector, right? I think the next two years will be, will be quite difficult for the smaller operators on a go forward basis. All right, I will leave it at that, right? Uh, I have a couple more slides, but I'll just, I'll just pause here uh, in the interest of, of time um, and welcome any questions. And if none, it was, a, it was a delight for me to be able to share some of this information with you all and hopefully uh, you better understand uh, the crises that the uh, industry that I uh, operate in is, is going through. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's going to be some positive outcomes of this. I think it will be, uh, you know, for, for climate, uh, the climate pivot, I think this is going to be positive. Uh, and, and I think there's going to be a little bit less uh, focus on uh, immediate, uh, let's call it, um, uh, well, I, I, think, I think a lot of the players in this sector are going, are going to take the long game approach. Right, and are taking this crisis as a moment to kind of rethink what should uh, the travel and tourism sector look like for the next 10 to 15 years. And you don't get these, you don't get these pause moments right, often in, in a sector. Uh, this is the one that we're going through and, and, and hopefully uh, we will make things better for every traveler right, and tourism operator in the world uh, moving forward. So, so oh. Benoit, Benoit uh, I think uh, given your presentation, uh, the biggest uh, outcome of this has to be that there has to be really rapid digital transformation happening throughout the sector not only not only with hospitality but with travel and tourism as well because if uh if the protocols were in place if there's contactless check-in if there are robotic maids if if uh, people can do whatever they want to do with the hotel staff through their phones instead of meeting people that would definitely increase um, the, um, uh, the, the confidence in the fact that they might not contract something. Because this pandemic has scared the, uh, the people and, 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 the, and, and the consumer behavior in a way that we don't know if this is over what else is in store. We don't know if there is going to be another strain coming up or another pandemic soon. Or, so so bio, bio weapons or bio war warfare is going to become a way of life and it's deeply ingrained in our psyche by now. So I believe technology, even IoT for that matter, would mm -hmm. definitely help bounce back to some extent. But where is the standardization if we were to standardize protocols for contactless hotels, contactless uh, air travel? How, who, who is the authority that does that? Which authority will do that? Uh, well, that's, that's been the struggle of the sector, right? Um, you know, e e look, you're, you're talking about uh, e connecting different sub-segments of an industry together, right? And, and harmonizing protocols and, and standards, right? We haven't even been able to do that well in the hospitality sector for managing inventory and rates, 
which you could argue is a fairly simple problem to solve, right? Uh, so when you think about sharing information around biometrics, right, across two or three different actors, uh, you can imagine the hurdles, right, uh, that come with that, right? So there are different bodies, right? There's a lot of, 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 of bodies that are actually trying to get the industry to kind of harmonize around processes and, and standards. The Open Travel Alliance, for example, is one. HTNG, right, is another one. There, there are bodies that do so, but the pace of change uh, is, uh, is extremely, extremely slow. Uh, affordability of the technology was a problem for a long time. I don't longer think that that's one of the major hurdles. Uh, and now it is more uh, a question of, can we benefit by harmonizing? And uh, can we earn more? Or do we stand more to gain uh, than the competitive uniqueness that we give up uh, by being different? And so right now, Hilton and Marriott, for example, are trying to have both their standards, right? Because they're competing against with each other. And one has to believe that if we harmonize the standards, right? Um, and leverage the playing field at the protocol right, level, uh, we could actually both those chains, for example, could make more from this, right? But that is a, a leap of faith that no, we haven't not, not yet seen them. because of the fragmentation of the industry that we live in. Yeah, but not only them, the airline industry would, and then they all have to dovetail th whatever they're doing back into contact tracing apps that Google are putting out there with the government data. Because, hey, I want to know if I'm in the airplane with someone even seated six feet apart, I want to know if he has been in touch with somebody who has had COVID or there's a chance that he's asymptomatic because the scariest part of this pandemic has been the fact that most people are asymptomatic and you, th there will be no way to figuring that out. So, so if we have to bounce back sector by sector, even to the extent of, you know, scale down versions of where we were, we need technology. Isn't that the baseline? And we need all these people working with each other to harmonize standards. Yep. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, right? So I, I definitely think you're going to see a steady stream of investment in this sector, right? Travel tech and, and VC investments in travel tech has always gone up for the last six years straight. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a little bit of a lull now, uh, but I, I wouldn't su su be surprised that you would see an influx of capital uh, yeah, in, so, in that sector. So so when the pandemic started and travel stopped, the first thing that really went out of um, um, out of the market was the bikes. People started like buy, buying bikes because it's contactless. Hey, we can travel on, and we can we can we don't have to use public transportation if we have cycles. And then of course um, um, uh, scooters, the electric scooters went up. I mean, there there has been constant VC um, investment into. But electric bikes, electric sco sco scooters, and other form forms of transportation which seclude people from other people, yep. and not public transportation. So that's a trend that's going on. And now going forward, maybe all these technologies, housekeeping, robotic maids, um, I mean, in the Bay Area, we already have a local grocery um, using robots to make delivery already. So that investment is going to come up. But within the hospitality sector, how do you bounce it back. You've got to bounce it back somehow, even if it's for, I mean, you're telling me vacation rentals are up. It could be the same for hotels. They could use the same traffic if they had all these protocols in place. Right? Agreed. Right. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a couple of beds. I'm, I'm flashing a slide here that I, I didn't go through, but it, it kind of shows that the eight big technology sectors, right. Uh, and, and where do we believe they're, they're heading? And as you can see, right. Uh, biometrics, voice assistance and chatbots, augmented reality, right. Are things that we're going to, I see a, a, an imminent adoption for and an accelerated level of investment in. Um, biometrics, for example, is an interesting one. Um, if you look at the smartest airport in the world, right, vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. um, everything is biometric. You come in, you're identified as a traveler, right? And then every single checkpoint, right, throughout the, from the check into the airline, all the way up to security, all the way up to passport control, everything is, it just tr takes yeah. your, your ID, Right, yeah. and follows you through the entire airport experience. So you never have to show a passport or, or show a, a piece of a, a documentation. Your phone and your eyes are sufficient, right? That's for, it. For, just for Dubai through. Airport, uh, that's been for the last six, seven years. I, yeah. I, go, I, I used to go to Dubai very often and literally I never had to pull my passport out. Once you enter the airport, I don't. My eyes do and my thumbprint is enough. And I think Canada and the Netherlands are probably the next two countries that you're going to see yeah. the most innovation, right? Uh, yeah. At the airport level. Yeah. Uh, around around biometrics, they're 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 leading the pack, right? In, in terms Benoit, of um, I have then thank you for the uh, presentation. First of all, it was very uh, very insightful. Um, I I have a question. So as uh, things will get better, obviously, um, you know, operators will be fighting for the business. Um, 
I guess what we were seeing before, you know, the crisis was that, you know, there was more and more efforts from the, you know, hotel chains, from the airline to get business directly from the, from the traveler, from the consumer by offering perks, you know, status, loyalty mm -hmm. program. So as things get better, do you see any changes in the role that, you know, agencies, whether online or, or not on offline, you know, will, will play in the picture or, or do you think, you know, things will, you know, in, in terms of, you know, how the business comes, you know, will, will be the same way as before? Uh, well, I, I, we will have to reinvent ourselves as well, right? As actors of the online travel, uh, in, you know, agency model, right? Uh, I think there's going to be a push for direct customer ownership. So hotels are going to try to get customers directly to come and interact with them. True. Right? We're going to try to get more customers to interact with us and bypass Google to the extent that we can because we give them way too much money. Um, so those are things that are obviously going to happen. But I think more so, I think the online travel uh, uh, agencies, which are essentially very large tech players right, uh, in the sector, could go much further right? and think about how could they actually become or provide platform capabilities right, to let the independent and, 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 and highly segmented actors right, make the most or drive that direct interaction between the customer uh, and their service. Hilton has a lot of money. Marriott has a lot of money to invest in R&D and tech, no doubt. But keep in mind that the hundreds of thousands of independent hotels don't, right? They don't have the expertise. They can't attract the talent and, and they certainly don't have the capital, right? And so I see an opportunity for players such as Expedia to say, well, let's build that, 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 that platform. Let's define those standards and then let's offer that technology, right? to these independent players so that they can run their business. So in a way, like imagine a Shopify of, of travel, right? Through uh, the platform and capabilities offered by uh, well-established uh, online travel agency players, such as uh, ourselves and, and, and our competition, right? We're not the only ones. But I would say that that's an interesting vector, which is move away from the traditional, right? Make money when you sell a component of travel to try to essentially uh, operationalize the platform and allowing independents to thrive uh, on this on this new platform through um, through shared standards, absolutely. General, just an observation, and thank you for the presentation uh, as well, Patrice earlier. Um, but I, I actually find your projections for uh, for business travel to be quite optimistic. Not because I not because I'm pessimistic, but because I think if that's if that's close to the approximate timeline, so 23, 24 return to so 2019 business travel, then as, a, as an investor, that's, that's actionable information that you can, you can invest behind because that, in what I do, that's, a, that's not even a full cycle, right? So that, that would indicate it being a good time to be making pretty aggressive investments into, um, um, into, the, into the hard asset side of the, of the travel industry. But just, just flashing this back, right? Co corporate travel, the, the row at the bottom, Richard, mm -hmm. we're expecting that even in 2024, right? When the rest of the hospitality industry and possibly uh, leisure travel uh, is back up, um, we're, we're still going to be behind, right? So I, I think it's going to be more than four to five years before corporate travel spend and revenue will come back to previous 2019 levels, right? Now, it, it, it's still a, a, a bounce back, but I, I think it will lag, right? Uh, the leisure sector. Significantly. Yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, hello, just uh, Christian speaking. I was just uh, bouncing on what uh, Richard said. What we see in, in, the, um, in the aircraft industry is that uh, typically we will start to see a rebounds in the avionics sector, which applies to the aircraft, which is before 2024. And that is, of course, to take up to, um, to, to support the, the growth who will be in more new aircraft and so on. So it's, uh, it's quite consistent. Ben, having said that, um, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Uh, Benoit had to drop off 15 minutes ago, but <laughs> unfortunately, I just saw the message. <laughs> but thank you all for being here for making this discussion possible for 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 this amazing session, Benoit, this has been so 
phenomenal today in the morning we've we've kind of gone over the media sector and we've gone over uh the um travel sector and it's been uh, quite an amazing discussion being with all of you in the evening we meet again 9 p.m pacific we will start with steve, uh, steve parker who as i told you his background is um is education worldwide for the state department um, and uh, he will talk about how he sees the deskless workers evolve from this COVID disaster. And then right after that, it'll be our, our, our friend Richard Price talking about the real estate market and how commercial and commercial real estate is going to make it make its way through and how it's going to affect the rest of the world and other industries. I think it, it's going to be a great discussion again tonight. Um, I love to see you guys tonight again and 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 uh, have a have a great rest of your day till we meet again. Sounds good. Thank you for hosting Thank me. Thank you all. Thank you, Benoit. Thanks all. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, guys.